Welcome to my presentation on Baltic Sea, Pressures and State. My name is Gerhard Czarnewski. I'm head of the Coastal and Marine Management Group at the Leibniz Institute for Baltic Sea Research in Warnemünde, Germany, and at the same time, professor at Klaipeda University. A brief overview after background on Baltic Sea specifics, I will introduce you to the policies behind and then focus very much on the present pressures and state of the Baltic Sea, finishing with cumulative assessments of uh, this state, and last not least, some conclusions. The Baltic Sea, a relatively small sea with 400,000 square kilometers, faces a large river basin. The river basin is four times larger than the sea, and this means the river basin very much influences the sea. And at the same time, the long water residence time of 25 to 30 years, meaning that once something enters the sea, stays for that time, makes processes and changes in the sea very slow. The sea is very much influenced by agriculture and the population. On the right-hand side, you see the number of inhabitants, the population density, and you clearly see that the population is focused on the southern Baltic Sea, Poland, Germany, Denmark, and to coastal areas, large cities like Stockholm or Helsinki. And the second aspect is agriculture. And here you see the same uh, picture. Agriculture is dominating in the south, indicated by red colors, while Scandinavia um, has mainly forest. So this means humans and agriculture very much influence uh, the Baltic Sea, and especially from coastal areas. The major policy framework is the Marine Strategy Framework Directive of the European uh, Union. And this has the aim to achieve a good environmental status of all European Union marine uh, waters. And it provides a legislative framework based on the ecosystem approach to management of human activities. It balances nature protection, social aspects, and the economic use. And important is that it defines a implementation strategy and clear steps and a timetable. And it includes 11 descriptive uh, descriptors that define the good environmental status. In the Baltic Sea region, this Marine Strategy Framework Directive is largely implemented by HELCOM, the Helsinki Commission. And the following results are based on these uh, HELCOM assessments and the HELCOM work. Let's start with drivers and pressures. Drivers are the human activities on the left-hand side, and the resulting pressures are shown on the right. The picture shall only show how complex it is and how multiple uses take place in the Baltic Sea and how this affects pressures and how many pressures. Let's have a look at the input of nutrients. So they are influenced by agriculture, by wastewater, by activities in the sea itself. So we have a very complex system in the Baltic Sea. I'd like to start with eutrophication. Still large amount of nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, are entering the Baltic Sea. About 800,000 tons of nitrogen, about 30,000 tons of phosphorus. And they are mainly coming from the river basins, transported with 
rivers. But with respect to nitrogen, the atmosphere plays an important role as well. And eutrophication is still a major problem and the state is still poor. But there are other aspects, such as hazardous substances. According to Helcom, hazardous substances cover organic chemicals, heavy metals, and radionuclides. And they are either toxic, persistent, and bioaccumulate, or they have effects on hormone and immune systems in marine organisms. I would like to focus a bit on the heavy metals and the indicator metals for assessments are cadmium, mercury, and lead. A major current source for these uh, metals is the burning of fossil fuels. And this means the major pathway is the atmosphere. They are entering via atmospheric deposition. And let's have a look at the state with respect to mercury. The picture on the left shows the last 25 years and a slight decrease in the mercury deposition is visible. The right hand uh, picture shows the resulting pollution status, the overall assessment, and red indicates it fails a good quality. It is too high. The problem is that mercury has still elevated concentrations in the Baltic Sea environment. Cadmium. With respect to cadmium, you see a um, stronger decrease during the last 25 years. But despite that, in most parts of the Baltic Sea, the status is poor. The concentrations are too high. Positive with respect to heavy metals is that legislation is in place and we can expect a further decrease in the loads during the next decades. Another important aspect in uh, the Baltic Sea are oil spills. During the last 25 years, the number of oil spills decreased significantly. In 2016, for example, only six cubic meter were observed with, uh, by airplanes. And this is something we see in all sub -basins. So there's a general dec uh, decrease of these oil spills. What is the overall assessment of the hazardous substances, the present state? On the left-hand side, all indicator organisms. I did show only some. And we have a look at the contamination score, at the red colors. And if you put all these indicators together, you see that the Baltic Sea gets a red color nearly everywhere. So the status is still poor, the contamination score still high. So a lot, a lot has still to be done. Another descriptor, marine litter. These bars show the number of items found at beaches. Usually a 100 meter stretch is surveyed and the items are classified and gray indicates plastics. So plastic contributes 80% to the overall number of items. And the bars indica are indicated for different basins of the Baltic Sea region. And the green line shows the threshold for a good status. And you immediately can see nearly all bars exceed this good status. So we have a still a serious problem with marine litter. This was about Marco litter, large visible parts. 
Now we have a look at mycolitter. And data on mycolitter is rare. So as a consequence, uh, model simulations were carried out to have a look how um, intensive the pollution by microliter is, and this focuses very much on urban uh, water-bound sources. And what we observe is on the picture on the right-hand side that especially near large rivers where the rivers discharge into the sea, we find relatively high concentrations. In the central sea, less than one particle per cubic meter. But if we have a look at the overall um, discharge, it is 60 trillion microplastic particles that are annually emitted from urban sources to the Baltic Sea region. So, despite the low concentrations, we have a serious problem with the high emissions because plastic particles are washed ashore. New is the assessment of underwater noise. Around 400 seaports are located in the Baltic Sea uh, regions. 90 of them of international relevance. About 2,000 ships are at every time present on the Baltic Sea. 11% of them are passenger ships and they transport about 50 million people per year. And altogether, 7,000 larger ships are permanently located in harbors around the Baltic Sea. And this means that the Baltic Sea fleet represents about 30% of the world fleet and 35% of the EU fleet. So shipping is important and this has consequences. Underwater noise. The three red signs indicate frequencies which were assessed, where noise was measured. And above, you see the activities. Shipping, of course, very important, but fisheries with uh, mapping sonars are important as well. Seismic surveys, pile diving, explosions, everything contributes to noise. And the blue bars show animals fishes, seals, and porpoises. And what you immediately see is that the noise generated in the Baltic Sea can be heard by these organisms, bothers them. This slide shows the intensity of the underwater noise. The yellow areas indicate a noise of more than 100 decibel. So this is the noise a circular saw or a waterfall creates. And in these areas, this is present in average 5% of all the time. Noise is everywhere in the Baltic Sea and a largely unknown problem. Another indicator, the non-indigenous species, alien, foreign species. They usually arrive via human uh, medi mediated transport. Therefore, harbors and ports are hotspots for the introduction of non-indigenous species. And the most probable vectors are aquaculture and shipping. And the species usually enter attached to ship hulls, biofouling, or were transported in ballast water. And this figure shows the development of the 
species. So how many species were introduced per decade? And we see from the 1950s uh, an increase. So these alien species are a pose, pose a threat to the marine environment because they can change the structure and dynamics of the ecosystem. But positive is that in 2017, with the Ballast Water Management Convention, this problem is tackled and we looking forward to decreasing numbers of alien species. And the small picture shows the round goby, a fish introduced into the Baltic Sea, which now starts to alter our uh, habitats significantly, a major problem. Fisheries. On the left-hand side, bottom trawling. On the right-hand side, surface and midwater trawling. And the brown squares indicate high fishing pressures. And if you have a look at the numbers, you find easily that about 40,000 tons were caught in these squares. This has consequences for the fish population itself, but surprisingly for the commercial uh, fishes shown here, we see that some of the demersal fish has a high mortality. Demersal means sea bottom fish. And pelagic open sea fish is even, has even a bit higher mortality indicated by these red areas. But with respect to spawning stock biomass, um, the bars are green, indicating a good status. And combined um, is a status that is mainly not so good. But with respect to the present assessment period, 2011 to 2016, and focusing on commercial fish, 50% of the assessed coastal fish and 40% of the pelagic fish shows a good status. So it seems that there is an improvement. Another problem, another descriptor for the state, seabed loss and disturbance. We have constructions, extractions, dredging, depositing of sediments, of harbor sediments, shipping and trawling, fishing. And this causes effects on the sea bottom. Partly we lose sea bottom as a natural habitat. Partly they are frequently disturbed. And this figure shows how intensive the disturbance is. The red bars are the areas in the Western Baltic Sea, in German and Danish coastal waters. And they are red because they have a, pot a potential disturbance uh, likelihood of 80 to 100 percent. So they are usually temporarily disturbed very often by uh, fishing. For the Antibiotic Sea, about 40% of the seabed is potentially uh, disturbed. So another serious problem. And if we now have a look at these pressures and the states, eutrophication, the head as a substances, non-native species, and ongoing fishing, and seeing that all these aspects have a dominating red color, so are not in a good status, then it is clear that the consequences on biodiversity cannot be good. So benthic bottom habitats and pelagic open water habitats are mainly in a uh, moderate to poor uh, status, so mainly pink to red. 
With respect to seals, it is especially problematic. Only positive is the situation of wintering water uh, birds, where efficient protection takes place. So having a look at all these problems, it's interesting to see what is the cumulative impact of all these um, pressures. And what is most important? What creates most harm in the Baltic Sea? And we clearly see that high nutrient concentrations, the nutrient loads, are most important, followed by hazardous substances, then alien species, extraction of fish, and anthropogenic sound. So we have serious impacts on the Baltic Sea. And this differs spatially very much. On the southern part, where a lot of human activities take place, where we have a lot of agriculture, and in the east, between Finland, Russia, and Baltic states, we have high pressures. And this figure indicates high pressures with red colors. And taken into account are altogether 55 single pressures and their effects on the Baltic Sea. So to conclude, major pressure on the Baltic Sea, eutrophication, hazardous substances, introduction of alien species and effects of commercial fisheries are above a sustainable level, are not in a good state. Therefore, the environmental health of the Baltic Sea is not sufficient and does not yet meet the policy objectives, Marine Strategy Framework Directive. There are measures taken so far and there are first improvements, but we need still additional measures. And something we did not address and something that is not taken into account in these assessments are the effects of climate change. Climate change is ongoing, we see the effects, and we have to take this into account in our future management. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention.